My name's Daniel Liu and I'm the CEO of the museum. It's been about four years that I've been here, so welcome, welcome, welcome. Members and special guests, um, this is a milestone evening as far as I'm concerned, both personally and, and for the museum. Um, we have a new mission, for those who aren't familiar, about decoding technology, the computing past, the digital present, and the future impact on the human condition. And this year, we're focusing uh, one of our themes on the art of code. And what better way to start the season than with a conversation about small talk. Um, I just want to make a little personal note for those of you who had something to do with small talk in the community or here for all sorts of good reasons. But on my uh, very first day at work uh, at Apple in uh, January 1981, um, I, after writing my little basic program and being oriented into the company and told that I would have an Apple II that I could be loaned to me and that I would own it at the end of a year, um, I went off to a, to a building and sat in a little room that had a one-way mirror on the other uh, side and it was Larry Tesler on the other side. And, uh, and it was Smalltalk running on a Lisa hardware system. So that was my introduction. And I just can't thank all of you who are here to celebrate this and those that had things to do with it for what you did, because it's still alive. So with that, uh, Marguerite Gong Hancock is going to do the program. She runs all of our uh, programming activities and also the Exponential Center. And if there's anything that's had an exponential impact on this industry, it's Smalltalk. So Marguerite, great. Thanks so much, Daniel. Well, I'm so glad to add my warm welcome to each of you on this special occasion. And as Daniel mentioned, this program begins our exploration for the next year about the art of code. So we're going to be bringing pioneering coders to the stage. We're going to be releasing historic source code. We're going to have a series of events and uh, content all around some special anniversaries, 50th of small talk. 40th of Postscript, 40th of Elisa, and other special things that we'll announce as the year goes on. We'll also be exploring what's happening now with software programming languages and explore some of the issues and impact of what might come next, so things to look ahead. So we're really thrilled to start off this series with Small Talk at 50. Happy birthday, Small Talk. And uh, we've all felt its impact, uh, and so, it's a very special opportunity. We're really thrilled to offer that to each of you, to bring together so many of the pioneers, the original people were there from its earliest days. Uh, even though he cannot participate in person, we're really glad that Alan Kay, who has been at the heart of Small Talk, has been actively involved with our team for this historic occasion. And it's especially fitting that next month, CHM will present our Distinguished Fellow Award to two of our featured guests, Adele Goldberg and Dan Ingalls. Yes. Make sure you see the Hall of Fellows that they will be joining. That's just right outside the door. Uh, tonight's Small Talk, uh, this reunion event has two parts. First, we're going to focus on Small Talk and Education, and then Small Talk and Research. And for this first section, our first guest is currently the Deputy Chair of the Science Advisory Board of the Heidelberg Institute for Theoretical Studies in Germany. At Xerox Park, she co-developed the small talk programming language with colleagues Dan Ingalls and Alan Kay. She's also one of the founders of Park Place Systems. Please welcome Adele Goldberg. So glad you're here, Adele. Our next guest was a young child during the height of small talk era at Xerox Park. Later, she pursued physics, typesetting, photography, insurance sales, and chemistry before eventually finding her calling as a software engineer. She currently works for Apple. Please give a very warm welcome to Rachel Goldine. Hi, Rachel. Our third panelist started his career as a teenager at Xerox Park working on small talk. Subsequently, he joined Apple as part of the original Mac team developing the Finder. But recently, he worked on natural language research at PowerSet, which was acquired by, uh, by Microsoft for Bing. He's currently a software engineer at Apple. 
let's welcome Bruce Horn. Now, who would be the right person to moderate? Well, we have just the right person. It's Dave Robson. He joined the Learning Research Group at Xerox Park in 1974 and worked on several generations of small talk. He also served as chief of staff at Willow Garage, at Savvy Oak, now Relay Robotics, and currently at Zebra Technologies. Please welcome to the stage, Dave Robson. Take it away. Okay, well, let me start by thanking the museum for uh, setting this up. Uh, it's a super opportunity to get together with uh, people that um, were incredibly fun to work with and uh, had a big impact on my life. So I thank you very much. Thank you. Before the conversation starts, my mistake for not mentioning earlier, we actually have video to help tee that up because you're gonna wanna see this. First, we have a two minute archival video. See if you recognize any of the faces then and now, and then um, that will be followed by a short video from Marion Goldine, another one of the original Small Talk Kids. Let's take a look at those now. The first Small Talk class was held in the spring of 1974. The students made use of illustrated project books. An example model is a definition of a box class. The program you are now seeing is probably the first example of a tool built by a child. You are watching a dance routine that Marion wrote in order to demonstrate the control she has over all parts of the object. Marion decided to teach her own class of seventh graders. Throughout our work, we have encouraged and emphasized the value of peer teaching in order to give a child experience in describing ideas and problems and in trying to understand the descriptions of other students. Yeah, I have one meal I'd like to show right here. Every time you hit mouse button one, the music editing system is under constant revision in an attempt to find a comfortable user interface for editing notes and timbres. Rachel has played piano since she was five years old. She corrects her mistake with the note editor. I have written a musical note display program which does run in real time. Now let's see a demonstration of this program in action. I'm Marion Goldeen, and a long time ago I wrote an article for Creative Computing, and Adele Goldberg made me start it out by saying, I am 13 years old. So I'll start out today by saying I'm 60 years old. <laughs> and <laughs> when I was um, 12 years old, I got the opportunity to come to Xerox Park and be a small talk guinea pig. And this happened because um, one of the boys in my math class, uh, his dad worked at Xerox Park and he was recruited to go ask if there were kids in his math class who wanted to come learn a new computer language. And uh, I was gung ho for this. And so were three other kids. So we all were carted off to Xerox Park to learn small talk. And it was a really great experience for me. I do remember writing some of the little classes and stuff that I did, like with the drawing program. I remember writing it, a, a lot of it out on lying on my stomach in the floor in, of my living room on a piece of paper, you know, and then going in and typing it in. I enjoyed it so much that Adele suggested that I might teach other kids. And so I got to continue to do that. Um, it was a really great introduction to computer programming. Um, much better than the teletypes and basic that were the other things that were offered at the school. Later on, I sort of got interested in some other languages. When I started um, learning Objective-C, it, it was like, this is beginning to feel a little bit like small talk, just a little bit, you know, brought back memories. And um, it was ultimately working in Objective-C that I ended up going back to um, actual employment and um, working for Apple. It was kind of a, a little bit of a round trip there. It's really been quite a journey. And uh, I hope that everyone in the audience can have an equivalently fun journey with their um, practice of programming. Also, I'd like to say hello to Adele and Dan and Bruce and all these people who I remember from those years.
Well, that was fun. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully she still remembers me too. Yeah, so. <laughs> okay, so let's start out with you, Adele, and talk a little bit about the kind of big picture and the context for all this. So what was Small Talk trying to accomplish and how did working with kids fit into that? So I joined Xerox Park in 1973. Mm -hmm. So Small Talk 72 already existed. And the question was, can anyone learn to program in this language, which had all these funny little icons and all this message grabbing? And if so, how? And so that was my initial assignment. Um, but as, as it evolved, we weren't so interested in understanding if learning to program would affect problem-solving skills. A lot of universities, a lot of research places were worried about that. We were very focused on creating a modeling environment and therefore having a simulation um, context and libraries and to see what kind of simulations but also tools the kids could, could write. Mm -hmm. and, and how did you get started with, uh, with the kids? Where'd you find them? <laughs> um, we found them down the hallway because the first kids that we taught were the uh, children of park employees. That's the least risk, right? Mm -hmm. And we put together a, um, uh, our altos in the basement and, um, and invited anyone to offer up children ages more like 9, 10, 11. Mm -hmm. We were trying to be successful. I didn't want to go too young. But we also um, had a visit from Radia Perlman, and she had the turtle button box. So um, my two-year-old learned to program on that button box. Mm -hmm. And once I had an idea of how to approach the language, I went to Jordan Middle School and met the, um, uh, Joan Targ, who was in charge of the MGM, Mentally Gifted Minor Program, and asked does she have kids who might le want to learn to program and who would be allowed to come up to Xerox? And she did, so she was their escort. And that was Miriam Goldine and Neil and the other kids that you saw in the video. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Okay, so kids, uh, <laughs> how did, uh, um, so how did you get involved in, and uh, yeah, forgive me if I call you Marion. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's okay, it's happened before. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> But uh, uh, you can speak for Marion as well. But how yeah, did? Sure. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. So Marion, as she said in the video, she was super excited to go up, and it just sounded like candy to her, you know, to go up there and, and play with computers. And and she really took to it and loved it. And you know, she brought it home. And I was much younger, and so I remember being about seven. In that video, I was seven. So maybe I was six, six maybe or seven when I first went up there, and it was just really fun to tag along with her and the environment. And you know, it was this amazing place where you could get free hot chocolate. As much as you wanted, and uh, there's a link there to Coco later on. But um, yeah, so uh, it was it was I, for me it was more of a play environment. But for Marion, she really dug in and did a ton of small talk programming. She was really involved there for about three years. And I remember I would bike up there with her up the hill and and um, have fun being there. But she was really digging in with the programming, and it, it cemented in her brain. I think at that developmental stage, age 12 to 15, really where um, you know, she's just brilliant. She's an incredible programmer now. So it's, it's like when you learn a language, a, you know, a spoken language young. I think that's what happened with her learning it young. And then she was able to you know, sort of help me tag along and learn it as an adult. I'm nowhere near as fluent as she is. Did, and did you do any small talk programming back in the day? Not okay. that I recall, no. Okay. So yeah. you were, you were uh, I, hanging yeah. out there for the fun and yeah, the Yeah, it, it was just fun for me, but okay. you know, well. definitely happy memories. And, and then I kind of learned through Marion a lot of the things that she learned. So cool. it was really, she led the way for me, yeah. All right, and Bruce, you did do programming, I know. Uh, yeah. So how did you get involved to start off with? Well, so I, I think I was uh, 14. I just started uh, ninth grade at uh, Gunn High School, and uh, my math professor, teacher um, Hawkinson, said, hey, there, um, there's this guy from Xerox Park, and he wants to have a couple kids come and do some work for him, right? And that, that guy happened to be Ted Kaler, who will be in the next panel. And so uh, my best friend, Steve uh, Putz, and I, uh, we were math geeks, and so we jumped at the chance, and so uh, 
there we go, we were off at, at park. And I have to say, of course, it was a tremendous experience. We were in the uh, building that is now gone that was across the street, and it was in the basement, and Ted was actually off at Carnegie Mellon, and so Steve Weyer was our handler. And so we got to use these, uh, you know, these really early altos, and you know, we learned a lot of, a lot of really interesting things. But um, I should say that later, coming, uh, being able to go, move into the big building across the street, um, when I was 14 or 15, I had an office with a door and a window, my own alto, and 20 disc packs on the floor. And now I have a laptop in a bag. It's been downhill ever since. <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Yes, well, I, uh, I remember when we moved into the big building, uh, uh, they ran out of offices. Uh, and so Ted and I wound up in a conference room, what was supposed to be a conference room, uh, and, uh, uh, which we shared with the uh, first color paint uh, system, which was, uh, was pretty cool. So, um, so Bruce, tell us uh, a few of the things that you did, uh, the projects that you worked on when you were uh, a teenager. Yeah, so, um, you know, I did a few small projects, as you saw in the, in the video. Um, and you also saw, actually, not in that video, but Steve Putz worked more a little in small talk. But I was really interested in kind of how small talk worked, you know, inside the guts of small talk. So I ended up doing um, kind of lower level stuff. So I worked on the note taker, uh, you know, the note taker BIOS, the first portable uh, small talk machine. That was super fun. I had like three or four of them on my desk at all times because only a couple of them would work at a time and I'd make them work again. <laughs> I had a logic analyzer um, and I kept them working and they were really, that was really fun. And, uh, and then I also wrote a bunch of the um, Dorado microcode for the small talk that ran on the Dorado which was then shown by Adele and Dan and others to uh, Steve Jobs. And then actually at one point um, Adele and, and Alan sent me off to Norway to implement a small talk on a machine in, in Norway for a Trigby Ranskog um, who wanted to have small talk. He had been a uh, visiting scientist uh, in LRG. And actually, coming all the way back around, Adele told me that he was coming because I had sent out on the you know, email, which we had back in those days, I said, hey, I'm interested in learning Norwegian. And Adele said, oh, well, this guy Trigby is coming. He'll be here for a year. That should satisfy your request. And then later I ended up going to Norway and, and uh, implementing small talk for there. Nice. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Now, Adele, as I recall, so originally the Jordan kids from Joan Targ's class came up to Park, but then eventually uh, you went down to Jordan uh, along with uh, one or two altos. Um, and so how did, how did that work, doing it in a classroom situation? So, um, so there were a lot of kids as part of her program. And she said, if we could set up in a room, we have a room allocated, and we just need some computers. And um, I told Alan. And he said, well, take them. And um, back then, and probably still now, I'm a goody two-shoes. And I said, don't we need permission? <laughs> and he said, we'll worry about that later. <laughs> so we. I had, a, I had a station wagon, so we got some help, and we packed up the altos, and we took them down to Jordan, to the, to the middle school. And um, I guess word went out that we had done that, because two days later, they were back at park. <laughs> <laughs> and we got permission. <laughs> and we tried to explain that school was starting, and you have to sync up your permission with the start of school. So then we took them back again. And it was a lot of fun. And what was really nice about being in the school is that instead of kids who were already predisposed to learn to program, mm -hmm. you got a mixture and um, kind of teamwork. And I used to say there were idea people, and then there were the implementers. And I really learned not everyone needs to have um, implementation on their resume, mm -hmm. that there are people with really good ideas of what computers can do for you, and teaming up with other kids to help do it was the theme of, as it, as it unfolded, it was pretty exciting to watch, to watch them working together. Yeah. You know, that's a great story, and I'd like to say six years later when I got to Jordan, I got to learn basic with line numbers. Oh. So it backtracked. <laughs> <laughs>
So, uh, and, and speaking of the kids playing different roles, I, uh, I remember, I think it was you that suggested that Marion teach other kids uh, uh, programming, which is kind of a recursive uh, um, application of uh, teaching small talk. So uh, how did that work out? She did great. There was a whole cl couple classes that she did. She was really um, careful in and she really understood objects and message sending. The paradigm really was working. Um, she would talk the kids through something they were gonna build and it's a model of something they understood and looking for the objects and looking for the protocol. Kind of what we were hoping to see and pretty much convincing us that this was the beginning of a modeling environment. Mm -hmm. It's not the end, the mission isn't done yet but um, it was certainly a good beginning. Mm -hmm. Cool. So on that uh, uh, sort of how things evolved into the future, uh, uh, how did the, the, I'll ask you Bruce to begin with, uh, how did that uh, experience um, impact the rest of your career, the rest of your uh, life? Oh, it made my career, right? It made my career. It made it obvious that that's what I wanted to do with my life. And, um, I can't say enough good things about that experience and the people and uh, you know people who had the patience to teach me things. I remember when I was working on the, the Dorado microcode, Willie Sue Haglin would help me with that and everybody would be open to helping. And it was, it was one of these things where I learned not only about what it would like, be like to be a software person and work in that field, but also how to treat people and how to get things done. And uh, I just, I can't say enough great things about that time at Park and, and the people, mostly the people. Park was the people. And uh, LRG was probably the best of all Park, I think. <laughs> it's, just my, it's just my opinion, but I think it's right. <laughs> Um, and uh, uh, any, I mean, you've said a little bit about how it uh, impacted uh, you Yeah, and I mean, my sister was really one, the one who got all the you know, brain part of everything and then by the time I was in my early 30s, I was finally finding my way to programming. And I remember I got a, you know, it was like the dot com, the first dot com boom era. Mm -hmm. And I got a job, but I didn't really know what I was doing. And so I'd go out into the parking lot, call on my cell phone and say, Marion, how do I do, what does this mean? How do I do that? Right. <laughs> and so like she really, you know, led me through and I, you know, I learned how to do it apparently, I guess, well enough. So. Yeah, so it was really, you know, kind of circling around, brought me into the, into the, into the fold. I have to say there's one other thing, though, from being at Park and then going out into the real world. Oh, my God, living in the future and then coming back to reality. <laughs> Man, that was hard. Yeah. That was so hard. I kept looking. It's like, this is what? I mean, it's just like uh, you were talking about the Apple II, and I'm, I'm going, how do I, how do I print? You know, where, how do I print from this thing? And it's like, oh, well, you write it on a disk with this program, and then you walk over to this other machine, and then you plug it in, and, and then it will print over there. And it's like, yeah. oh, my God. <laughs> I'm so, it took me a while. It took me a while to realize, okay, this is where we start, right? This is where we start. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, certainly I remember, the, I mean, the, the energy that the kids brought was, uh, was also a big thing. Uh, and, and, in fact, towards the end of... Uh, uh, even while LRG was still around, but uh, uh, towards the end, there weren't as many kids, and it, it did affect the, um, the sort of energy. We still have fun, uh, but uh, it wasn't quite the same, not having, uh, you know, 12-year-olds around. Uh, uh. Well, uh, and so, uh, how does it feel being back with the, uh, with the old crew? Oh, tremendous. I mean, I... I the feeling, and I was, as I was driving over here from work, I was going, well, so what are those feelings? And I would say um, just gratitude and appreciation for um, not only what I got to experience, but how it changed the world, right? How it, Park changed the world, and um, that we could get to live in that world. Um, and just and, and personal gratitude to all of the people, right, that were involved and in being willing to, you know, put up with these young kids like me who had a lot to learn, right? And uh, that's, that's how I feel. So any, uh, uh, you guys have been awesome. Uh, I was worried that I was gonna have to uh, 
take a strict uh, hand on time here, but uh, yeah, <laughs> you, did, you did good at netting it out, uh, even a huge story. Uh, so any, uh, any final uh, remembrances? Of Can I tell a Bruce Horn story? Please do. <laughs> I don't, you don't know this, and usually I don't say anything, but since you brought up um, the demonstration to Steve Jobs, um, one day I had two children, and one of them was sick, so I came late to work. Was told that the conference room was full of the Lisa programming team, and um, and Diana Mary was giving the usual demo. We gave demos to everybody. All the the time. Okay, sorry. So <laughs> there was this conference room, and full of oh, okay. Uh -oh. <laughs> Hardware failure. We're software people. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was. Okay, so I arrive and it's 10 o'clock and there's the Lisa programming team in there and I stick my nose in to see who's in there and Diane is giving the usual demo. We had people come once a month. We had, we entertain anybody. It was easier to just do it once a month, open the doors, right? And I saw you sitting there, Bruce. But I was still a park at the time, by the way. I saw you sitting there, <laughs> and you were um, and you were presented as part of the programming team, and you were under non-disclosure to the Xerox Corporation, and I was told that I was supposed to go in and give a demo because Steve wasn't leaving until I did, and um, and I said, I want permission. <laughs> There's a theme here, right? And um, because we didn't have clearance to publish yet. And what I said was, we give that demo in front of someone who's going to be part of that team, and we've just violated the non-disclosure. Are you really ready to do that? And it turned out that there was a deal, a deal with the venture capital group. And yes, and they I said, call corporate. They call corporate, yes. And so I have to thank you, because by insisting on that, that's how we got permission to publish the small talk books, uh -huh. because they had already done it. So that was a bellwether day, a good day. Well, and I'll, I'll finish with a little story about the uh, smuggling the altos out of, um, <laughs> uh, down to Jordan Junior High. Uh, several years later, uh, uh, Xerox was approached, well, actually, uh, a Xerox subsidiary was approached by a company that claimed to have a uh, patent on things that we were doing. Uh, and uh, essentially, the original patent looked like it was a patent on bitmap graphics. Um, but a lot of the claims had been um, already challenged. But the one they were trying to enforce was using uh, XOR to put a cursor in, into a bitmap. So you XOR it in, XOR it out, and uh, as it moves around. And uh, so I think they didn't realize that they were uh, negotiating with Xerox. They thought they were negotiating with a, with a subsidiary. Uh, so it came to the Xerox attorneys, and they, and they said, well, this looks you know, like something that probably happened in small talk. And so they found their way to us. And so we put together a whole description of what we'd done and showed how the small talk system used that uh, technique. And they said, well, but you have to have disclosed it, right? You can't have kept it secret. And, uh, and so the question is, who saw this system that was not under non-disclosure? Um, and uh, so it was, the, uh, it was Jordan Junior High. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so, so on behalf of the Xerox attorneys, thank you for uh, smuggling the machine. <laughs> okay, so uh, well, we're a minute ahead. Uh, uh, good job. It's great to see you all, uh, and uh, we'll uh, we'll talk more later. Uh, but, uh, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adele, Rachel, and Bruce. We're so thrilled to hear you look back at history and also to bring us up to the future. So thank you again for joining us. On thank, you. thank you. Now we turn our focus for the second part uh, on the Learning Research Group at PARC. 
And to help set the stage for the second part of this evening, let's watch a three minute video which captures the reflections of Diana uh, Mary Shapiro, who was one of the core research scientists working on small talk at Xerox Park. Hi, I'm Diana Mary Shapiro. I joined uh, the learning group. I was I, one of Alan's first employees. I had come to Park as a secretary, actually, and uh, managed to convince Alan to let me have a try at programming. I worked on lots of things. The first programming I did was actually a ROM blower in um, Pascal. Uh, that was before uh, Dan had actually done uh, a version of uh, Smalltalk. For the Alto, I did mostly uh, in the beginning, in the very beginning, I did the character um, display code. Uh, the mechanism for display was um, line driven. Before the Alto actually came into being, we had access to a character generator with a data general Nova connected to it, uh, which I sort of began to develop uh, character scanning um, algorithms. And um, then I did that in Smalltalk, and I did lots of text editing kinds of code and graphics kind of code. Did lots of stuff. <laughs> Eventually, uh, Dan and Ted be, were in the group right after I came in. Uh, they had been working with, the, uh, with uh, Alan before, I believe, a little bit. And uh, then Adele joined, and uh, then I'll let them tell their own stories. I'm delighted to introduce our next panelist that will be joining Dave here on stage. Our first guest for this panel has worked on every version of Small Talk and Squeak since 1972. He was on the four-person team that built Small Talk 76 in just nine months. Later at Apple, he advised and worked with Bill Atkinson during the creation of HyperCard. Join me in welcoming Ted Kaler. Our next guest started his career at Xerox Park as a student research intern in the Learning Research Group. Then he was a software at Tektronix for a couple of years. Returning to Park, he worked on the Smalltalk system and co-founded Park Place Systems, where he held many positions, including Vice President of, of Engineering. Please welcome Glenn Krasner. Last, but certainly not least, at Xerox Park, he co-developed the Smalltalk programming environment with Adele Goldberg and Alan Kay. He is the principal architect of five generations of Smalltalk environments. He designed the bytecode um, virtual machine that made Smalltalk practical in 1976. Due to a recent bicycle uh, accident, he is joining us remotely this evening. Please give a special welcome to Dan Ingalls. Dan. <laughs> Okay, well, welcome. Thank you. So uh, let's start out with uh, some background uh, and uh, how you got involved with, uh, with this stuff, with this group, with this uh, work, um, and uh, what kinds of things did you do uh, uh, early on when you were uh, working with uh, LRG and Smalltalk? So Ted, we'll start with you. Um, so I actually, um, uh, Dan and I, uh, met Alan Kay because his group was across the hall and we were working on speech recognition at Xerox Park and we kept going over there across the hall to see what was going on and it was really interesting including this machine called the CGen machine which was Diana described which had proportional spaced fonts and little pictures right in the font you know right uh, like um, uh, you know Winnie the Pooh was right in the text um, so in the fall of 1972 uh, Dan went to work for Alan and I went to grad school uh, but I kept coming back and writing little pieces of code uh, for Alan and Dan. Um, and anyway, it was uh, amazing things happened, which uh, Dan will tell you about. Um, that's how I got to the group. Okay, good. And uh, Glenn, how did you get there? Um, yeah, my last year at Stanford, um, I was looking for a place to live and ended up in, in a house. Uh, Ted Kaler was also there. Um, and I got 
he gave me a demo at some point. Mm -hmm. I was obviously blown away. There was the small talk and the hot chocolate. <laughs> the hot chocolate, <laughs> right, yes. Um, and then, like I said, went to Tektronix, came back, got a real job, and stuck. <laughs> All right. And Dan, hey, Dan, good to see you. <laughs> well, it's good to be here. I wish I could be in here completely in person. Yes, yes. Well, yeah, I, I, I was going to thank the, the Computer History Museum for getting the band back together, and it's not quite the whole band and not quite together, but, uh, but <laughs> good, good enough. So, yeah, uh, give us your perspective on, the, on your early days with, uh, with small talk in the group. Well, let's see. Um, it, it was so much fun. I uh, did carry the, uh, the, the first picture of it, which was we just happened to be across the hall from Alan Kay. But, uh, but Alan Kay created such a vision of the excitement of computing and um, in that excitement for kids and learning. And so that drove my um, you know, passion to implement his first uh, shot of what might be a language that, uh, based only on objects that communicate by sending messages. And that became Smalltalk 72. And, uh, and I just continued to follow that um, with a bunch of you guys and then with other folks. They do um, small talk 74, small talk 76, which was a complete redesign of the language and the virtual machine. Um, small talk 78, which ran on the on an 8086 as soon as they became available. Um, and then small talk 80, which of course went out publicly. Um, and then uh, and then on to squeak. And I'll say something about that, which was um, along with this passion came a passion to get it out to the world because it, it, to me it was so much fun to work with um, and you know I, to me i wanted to get that out to the masses the other people who thought the way i did would be excited um so that uh that drove my interest coming back to the tweet which was uh which was completely open source and uh and then it also incorporated a bunch of the features that alan wanted for a language that could be the platform for a new generation of learning software. Uh, and, and so thanks to the hard work of Vanessa Freudenberg and, and, and a lot of work that I did pulling it together, you can actually see a lot of these old systems running in the Smalltalk Zoo that's sponsored by the CHM. It's, uh, they created a website that I could use um, so you, uh, if you've got that kind of an inclination, you can have fun playing around with it, and feel free to uh, send us mail about it. Great, great. Well, uh, I'll jump in here and be a panelist as well as the, uh, the moderator, since I, I uh, kind of fit this. I, I wasn't a teenager, so I didn't get to be a part of the last panel, but, uh, <laughs> um, but I... Um, uh, in 1974, I was finishing school at UC Irvine, and um, we had to do a project, an implementation project, as part of your, your senior year. And a friend of mine, Frank Zadibble, uh, uh, had heard something about this thing that was going on, small talk. Uh, you know, he asked me if I'd heard of the Dyna book, and uh, no, and said, well, you know, they, uh, there's this guy saying that uh, computers, you know, like this PDP-10 that we usually use, it's all gonna be in the size of a notebook, and you're gonna carry it around, and anybody can program it in this thing called small talk. And I said, wow, that's, uh, uh, that's pretty amazing. Uh, uh, where, where is that? And I said, oh, uh, uh, it's uh, up in uh, Palo Alto. And I thought, oh, that makes sense. I've heard about, uh, you know, in Northern California, and uh, he says, yeah, it's a, it's a Xerox Research Center. And I said, Xerox, really? Uh, but um, so he talked me into implementing Smalltalk. And then after we had signed up to do that, I find out there's nothing written about how you implement Smalltalk. Uh, uh, and there was one paper that got smuggled out of park uh, that um, uh, Alan had written, and it was more poetry than engineering. Uh, <laughs> and so I was worried I wasn't going to graduate. Um, but uh, somebody told me that uh, Alan was uh, perfectly friendly and happy to talk if you uh, walked in the front door. So I came up to Palo Alto, uh, talked to Alan for half an hour. Um, more poetry. Uh, I still didn't understand how to uh, implement it, but he introduced me to Dan, uh, and Dan answered all my questions. Uh, and, um, 
And I think, and then uh, I went back to school. I was about to graduate and I got a call saying, would you like to come up and be a summer intern? Um, and uh, so the only thing I can think of other than just expressing interest in small talk was that I asked Dan the question, I said, why in small talk 72, why aren't classes represented as instances of classes? Everything's supposed to be an instance right, of a class. Yeah, all right. and, um, yeah. and he said, well, of course they should. Uh, and he said, we took a few shortcuts, you know, just to get this implemented, but we want to do that. Um, and so I think that may have been the reason that, uh, that they decided to bring me north. Uh, and uh, and this, so that was one of the first things I did was, uh, at Small Talk 74, in which class, there was a class of classes that were classes of everything else. Um, okay. So, uh, Ted, tell us uh, a little more about the stuff you worked on as, you, uh, uh, as your career progressed in the uh, Small Talk group. You did a lot of interesting stuff. Okay. Uh, actually, first I want to set the the scene for how we developed things in those days in Small Talk right. 72. So we had, besides smuggling the machines to Jordan Junior High School, we had smuggled a machine to Dan's house. So he was the first person I knew who had a computer at home. It was an Alto. Um, and uh, Dan would ride back and forth on his bicycle with a disc pack, these um, you know, 1.5 megabyte disc packs in his, in his backpack. Uh, and so on Friday, Dan would have thought of uh, things he wanted to do to small talk. Uh, and he would you know, take the current system in his uh, backpack, go home, put it in the Alto, work all weekend on completely restructuring things. And I mean really big changes to the system uh, and not caring how we all felt about that. And uh, <laughs> okay, so then Monday morning he would arrive back with the new system. And we, would, uh, we had a couple of Altos that had two disk, uh, disk drives on them and we would start copying the system off on, and also I think there was a, a server somewhere too. Um, uh, Max. Um, so, but in, you know, early in the morning on Monday morning, we would all get a copy of the new system, and then each of us was working on something that was able to be filed out and filed in. And so we would file out what we had done and file it into the new system, and nothing worked. Okay, so then we would repair and repair and repair. And about one, or, you know, af just after lunch, everything would come up and we would have all of our stuff in the new system. And then we'd work for a week uh, developing some more. And it was incredibly fast turnaround and very comprehensive. And Dan felt he could uh, do anything he wanted to to make the system better and we would go along with it. And, and we did. <laughs> <laughs> So Dan, you got a, uh, you have any uh, observations about how things, uh, how things worked back in those days, how we worked together? Yeah, uh, well, that, um, that rapid turnaround is so important. You know, um, the, the minute we had some, something new developed, it could be spread to the whole group or anywhere else. And that was, uh, that was really the, the liveness of languages that we developed the whole small talk series of languages our lives in the, you know not only can you change anything but the source the source code is there so if you want to change something fundamentally you can do that and then even in the laboratory it was the case as ted says when i would finish something i I'd bring it all in and we'd spread it around and everybody deal with the problems but also be then living in the next next generation and uh and that that happened also with the uh with the other labs at Xerox Park to a certain degree, because we we participated in their group communications called Beeler and would uh, would share things that we had invented and also try out stuff that they thought about doing but that just were too hard to do in the systems they had. Well, that's, a, that's a, another interesting topic is that uh, uh, Park was a, uh, I mean, the small talk group, LRG, was, uh, uh, was certainly a, a group of uh, fantastic uh, uh, people, programmers, uh, et cetera. But it was in the wider context of Park, which was, uh, which was an incredible uh, environment. And uh, uh, there were people that sort of moved back and forth between the various uh, groups. Uh, uh, I saw uh, Peter Deutsch uh, here in the audience and uh, John Schock. Uh, I saw, and uh, uh, there may be other other folks I haven't uh, haven't seen yet, but uh, but that whole environment of Park in the in the 70s, I think, was one of the things that contributed to uh, the great things that happened with Small Talk and how Small Talk turned out. 
so I, uh, any, any other recollections of working in, with Alan? Alan, of course, was, the, uh, uh, was a pretty incredible, uh, is a pretty incredible person uh, and, uh, and had a big impact on all of us. Uh, um, I remember uh, Alan used to come in early in the morning. He liked to um, take uh, showers at Park because the water pressure was better than uh, <laughs> in his house. Uh, and he said he did his best thinking in the shower. Uh, and so it was a contribution to the, the work. Um, and, and I remember there, there were a lot of periods where uh, I would come in relatively early, not as early as he did, but then I'd find Dan and Alan you know, talking about ideas about how should we do this, how should we do, uh, you know, uh, the one I remember is, uh, could we implement everything with just one big giant hash table, uh, right? There are all these lookups that happen, looking up messages, looking up uh, variable names. Uh, couldn't it all just go in one huge hash table? And, uh, and so there'd be like an hour of conversation early in the morning, and then Alan would go off and write, I think, and Dan would go off and implement. Um, and the next day, it was like, uh, well, yeah, that was a good idea, except this didn't quite work right. And then, um, uh, then we'd figure that out. So, uh, uh, so it, was, um, uh, it was very fun. Uh, and Alan was certainly a, uh, uh, he was an interesting, I, I mean, I think technically he was my boss. I think I, I reported to him, but I'm not quite sure. Uh, uh, it was, uh, it was. <laughs> I'd like to say something about working with Alan, just because uh, it, it was an unusual culture in the group. Um, but the uh, the thing I remember most is that it was it was like showbiz. So Alan would think of something that he wanted to do, an effect he wanted to create, or a talk he wanted to give, and he would share it with all of us. And he had so much passion that it just it seemed to create it out in. In the, sort of in the ether, and we, you know, we could get enough of that that we could go and actually make those things happen, and uh, so that was one way that things happened. And another, th another thing happened when he went away to do these things. It was a little bit like, not like the cats when the cats away, the mice will play, but you know, we were free to do absolutely anything, and we would try out weird stuff and play with all the tools that we had embedded, um, and that play really contributed to the, the progress of, of our systems. Oh. So playful and, uh, playful and inspiring. Well, and I remember Alan uh, complaining sometimes that we were um, skewing the system a little bit towards uh, system programmers, right? That, uh, uh, and um, I, I remember at the time I didn't know what he was talking about, you know, uh, um, because we were just doing um, cool things, right? But uh, uh, we were doing them for ourselves, and we were, of course, systems programmers. Uh, and now I have a better uh, kind of um, uh, feeling for what he was talking about, that uh, 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 we were doing things that were very cool for systems programming, but, um, but there was a wider audience for it. Uh, I remember he used to quote the I think it was Bob Barton uh, that system programmers were a uh, were high priests of a low cult. Uh, <laughs> right. Yes. 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 Yeah. So Alan later really uh, uh, told us that uh, we were a very odd percentage of the population. So I shouldn't be touching my microphone. Uh, that we were different from other people, which is true. And but we didn't. We couldn't see it. You know. Yeah. So many many times later, he did things like give everybody a recorder at off sites. He would give everybody the recorder musical instrument and try to play it, you know, and we would learn something. We would real, realize how hard it was to be a beginner. And another time it was violas, okay? And another time it was uh, ukuleles, okay? And so, uh, of course, we couldn't do anything with these things. And he said, that's how it is for most people with programming, you know? And so you, you know, we've got to have it be easy and, and, you know, we've got to ease people in somehow uh, based, you know, uh, build on things they already know. Mm -hmm. um, I want to add something else here. Uh, sorry, Glenn. But, uh, <laughs> um, uh, so Smalltalk also 
was strong for developers. Like we had uh, very early on, we had who's the implementer of this message? You know, let, show me all the implementers. Uh, show me all the senders of this message. Uh, these were things I think that Lisp had already, but we we tuned them very well. And uh, we were constantly trying to make things easier for the programmer. Uh, we had, you know, uh, change sorters so you could see all your changes. And um, just many, many, many of these little inventions that uh, really made the system good. And um, we, it, was, it was something we really wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to say anything, Glenn, here? <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I think that's all right. Um, and some of that was like in the name of being understandable, but we may have made the wrong decisions um, trying to do both. Yeah, Alan did exhort us to burn the disk packs at a couple of those off-sites yes. for Harrow Dunes. Yes. What, what he meant was, we're drifting too much toward the, the system's programmer side, and we've got to get back to the other side. Yes, that's right. That's right. And then every once in a while, he was, well, yeah, he wasn't happy with the new disk packs either. Right. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, he was, yes. he was interesting in those days. He was a real, he was a real mix of being, uh, you know, in some ways kind of a curmudgeon, um, but being just super supportive and super, he, he had that kind of balance uh, uh, really well. Um, well, then it really uh, fed into the squeak work because uh, it's absolutely true that we did go the commercial development route with our uh, integrated development system, which which was astounding and did change the industry, but it didn't do anything for teaching kids. And uh, and Alan felt that that still was yet to come. And uh, when we pulled together enough of the things in Squeak that really gave you control over media and let you do it quite iconically, um, it really gave a chance to do some of those things that Alan wanted. And uh, he, uh, so, and that, that uh, sort of created the whole environment of eToys, which was, the, which was put out on the One Laptop for Child project. But if any of you are interested in it sometime, you ought to see the, the demo of my favorite eToys, which Alan did. And it's a bunch of musical instruments all controlled by eToys. Pretty cool. So, you know, one, one, opportunity that I think we have coming together here uh, is uh, I remember one of the things about being uh, in LRG and at Park uh, in the 70s was there was just a lot of talk about the future, right? What's the future of computing uh, going to be? Uh, and that was sort of the, a big part of the mission. Um, and um, you know, I remember people talking about, well, what's computing going to be like in the 80s, right? That was the future. Uh, um, but here we are, we're really in the future, right? And uh, so uh, sort of we have the opportunity to look back, you know, there was an image of what we thought the future was going to be like uh, um, in 1972, four, six. And so here we are in 2022. Uh, how, uh, you know, to the extent that you can remember what you thought it might be 50 years down the road, why, uh, how, does, how does this compare? We failed on the uh, uh, ordinary people coding and ordinary people making their own simulations part, mm -hmm. um, except for spreadsheets. Mm -hmm. I know that so, uh, you know, people do a sort of a simulation of their financial situation on spreadsheets. Why don't they do simulations of other things? Mm -hmm. And uh, so um, would they, it's still a special person who does that right now. And it didn't, um, uh, but Alan was certainly right about the media part. You know, it has become a media, mm -hmm. uh, a media medium. Right. Uh, and, uh, and not necessarily in the way that we wanted, but uh, it's, yeah. it really happened. No, that's a good point. It is personal and it's dynamic yeah. um, and it's a medium, right? But it's not quite right. Not, not as compositional, not as creative, right. uh, you know. Right. Yeah. I want to say one thing that's a credit to the Xerox Corporation, which is that, you know, they did give us the support to do these experiments. Um, you know, they're pretty costly. I mean, we had costly machines and costly people. Um, but we could do anything we wanted. And so we had a chance to try out things that, you know, that, it, on, that we could tell on future machines would be much better, um, except that uh, right now they may not be practical. And it, it, I really realized this when we brought Smalltalk 76 to life 
in one of the simulations that's in the zoo. It runs, you know, like 10, 10 times faster than it did. And there, there are some features there in the user interface, like scrolling text, which actually we had the feature in there that it would go continuously as you move the slider up and down. But it actually was harder to use then because the text would be changing always a little bit behind you. So we left it that you would click where you want to go, click where you want to go. Um, but you know, we had we had seen that and thought about it and put it in so that the code would work that way. Yep. Well, in fact, I, my memory of, of one of the famous uh, uh, Apple engineer visits to Park um, was that uh, Dan was um, demoing uh, what I thought was really cool, which is that um, you could hit Control C anytime you wanted to. That would uh, uh, essentially stop the program wherever it was and open up the debugger, just as if an error had happened at that point. So then you saw the whole uh, call stack, and you could go up and, and look at what was going on. And uh, he was um, selecting some text, which at the time we we did reverse video for the for the selected text. So it looked like a black box with the now the text is in white, and uh, he hit control C while the selection was running, and he went in and he changed the program for how you highlight text so that it would outline um, the text, and then started it up again, and it worked like that, and, uh, which I thought was pretty amazing. Uh, yeah, it but didn't work like that at that point. the guys who were looking at it, they had, I think they'd never seen anything scroll smoothly like that. And so they got their nose right up to the, uh, the display and they said, scroll it again, scroll it again. Uh -huh. um, and, uh, and I'm sure they did appreciate the, uh, the debugger and, uh, and all of that or what we were trying to show them. But, uh, but it, was the, uh, it was that scrolling that, uh, that they found uh, amazing. Uh, and of course, the bitmap display, uh, uh, yeah, uh, that was a huge uh, sort of boost to the kinds of things that we wanted to do. Um, Okay, well, we are right on time. So uh, it's been a great pleasure uh, seeing you again. Uh, we'll have to catch up some more here between, uh, between the show, but uh, thanks, for your, uh, thanks for your memories. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Th thank you all. I'm gonna name all the names to Dave and Dan and Ted and Glenn and Adele, Rachel, Bruce, and all of you, many of whom had things to do with this. Thank you so, so much for this. Um, some of you got the message that I got about the Hawaiian shirts. And so one of the things that I, I um, wanted to, to comment on, I mean, the fact that Alan had you all musical instruments. He was the conductor. He still is the conductor. Um, but the aloha spirit made me think of it. It was obviously warm out today as well, but peace, unity, humility, and kindness, which is I think what was shared among all of you uh, in this intimate program for, for those members and special guests. So thank you all for coming.